I'm offering is an infinite list of different sorts of things. And worse, I'm saying these are not the same sort of thing. So if the problem to understand communications overload is to define what communication acts are and not define the human, now what I seem to be suggesting is that there's lots of different communications acts. How can you have an analysis? How can you render the world tractable to investigation if you have an infinite set of possibilities of diverse phenomena? Well, I think you have to face up to that. I think you have to think and understand communication as being sets of doings, as social acts, many acts. And you have to understand those acts for what they are. Now, what does that mean? It means, for example, if I go back, what I'm obliged to is to understand communication in an organizational context, to understand enchantment as being about romance. So when you explain that as communication, when you address the problem of communication overload, think about what enchantment entails, how, how seduction works. And does seduction fail because it's overloaded with something? Well, actually, yes, it does. Someone can be put off because someone else is too keen and their expression's too freebrile. Someone can be enchanted and enticed and seduced because just a whisper's been offered, just a little tantalizing little fresh expression. So maybe you can analyze communications acts in ways which are relevant to those acts. And this is the lesson that you should take from the now much neglected philosopher, Ludwig Wittgenstein, who's buried just up the road from where I work, in fact. And pretty much neglected in contemporary philosophy because it's been dictated by Quine and the kind of the empiricists. His argument, he was perplexed by two sort of things. One was the questions that philosophers asked, like, how do we know there's a real world? And he said, what a stupid question. If you ask that question, there's obviously something wrong with you. He'd say, it's just a nonsensical question. Only philosophers construct artificial questions and then come up with an artificial method to prove it, like Moore said, I have a, a hand here and I have a hand there and I can see them, therefore it, the, the world exists. And Wittgenstein's answer, it's a silly method for a silly question. But he was also interested in another thing, which was how we're enchanted and trapped by psychology, for example, at this particular moment in time, and behaviorism. And his concern was that Descartes created a vision of the world of inside and outside and created this idea that we struggle to get inside people's heads. And he said, Wittgenstein said, well, occasionally we do. But for many of the things we do, actually we start from the premise that we are in a world in common, that I know what they're thinking. It's only occasionally do you find these situations where you have misunderstandings. And we have words for it, labels for it, some misunderstandings. We live in a world which is subjectively experienced but shared in common. We live in a world in common. Now, if that is the case, why is it then we start doing things like laboratory experiments to understand what people think? He, Wittgenstein said, well, why don't you just ask them? He was suggesting that there are problems with method. Now, Wittgenstein is often associated in, in, with a kind of like an uh, anti-scientific approach. He wasn't anti-scientific. What he was trying to suggest was that when you are thinking about things, when you're thinking about, for example, phenomena, Think carefully about what that phenomena is. And once you've been thinking carefully about it, think appropriately about how you approach it. So my father-in-law is absolutely right. If you're thinking about signage on a motorway, forget human tendernesses, obligations, expressive artfulness for seduction. Think about the human as an information processor, viewing content, content coming in and being able to process at certain sorts of time. Wittgenstein was saying, that's right, but don't apply that method for other sorts of problems. Now, um, <clears throat> think, for example, in HCI, the turn to ethnography. Now, it seems to me that anthropologists are obsessed with ethnography. If you say to anthropologists, I think this would, would benefit for some laboratory investigations, or worse, quantitative stuff, they're obsessed with, deny it, it can't possibly be the case. But what you need to argue, and I think what Wittgenstein teaches is that you need to think about what the problem is. And communications acts are these, and not the same methods in every single case. So, to illustrate, I have a little way to go yet. So. One of the things I wrote about with uh, some colleagues a few years ago was about texting. And when I was then working, I was working um, as an academic trying to make a living as a consultant as well. 
I was trying to explain to people like Vodafone and Orange why people texted. And initial studies said that people texted because it was cheap. So we looked at teenagers and we looked at the texts and we discovered, number one, it's not cheap because the volume of teenagers texted was much, much greater in terms of the cost it implied on their wallet than if they just spoke. In fact, they weren't texting because it was cheap. They said they texted because it was cheap because they were trying to think of an excuse to mum as to why they kept asking for 30 quid. Oh, I'm just texting mum, it's cheap. And mum would say, oh, okay, at least you're not making phone calls. But actually, they were texting, and when they were texting, they were creating this web. What they were doing was making text gifts. I send a text to my mate, and my mate has to oblige back. Now, these text gifts, some of them are obvious text gifts, like teenagers going out with each other. Boys, we had a great transcript of a boy complaining about having to send goodnight texts. He had to send his girlfriend goodnight texts, and if he didn't, he would get dumped. And so we said, what do you mean you get dumped? So well, in the morning, she would send me a text saying, you're dumped. And then he would complain about the fact it's so cruel being dumped in that way because she doesn't have the courage to talk to you. But he felt, and he was exemplifying, that what people were using SMS for was creating a system, a kind of economic system of reciprocity. But the reciprocity of and economics were about tendernesses, intimacies. And one of the properties about the text, and the reason why he sent a good night text was because it arrived under the pillow. Mum and Dad couldn't see, so it was like whispering into your girlfriend's ear, privately. It, it was intimate. But one of the properties of it being intimate was not only did she see it at night, and she might send some saucy stuff back, but weirdly, the next day in the playground, they would go, hey, look. They would show the private stuff publicly. So the traffic, which turned around the fact that it was private, gave a value which meant making the private public was a real commodity in the playground. And some of it, for a middle-aged man, is very embarrassing. What's a phone call? Is a phone call the same sort of thing? When you phone someone up, I phone my mum. In fact, I don't think I've written to my mum in years. But I phone my mum every two or three days. Now, what am I doing? Am I listening to my mum? Does my daughter listen to me? Oh, that's a question. Um, I'm phoning my mum because I'm showing I'm a dutiful son. And I'm phoning up to see if she's all right. And actually, she chats. She's very happy, my mum. But she kind of tells me things about what's happened in the garden and the cat and the, she, there's a cat down the road called the terrorist who comes around and terrorizes her cat. And, and I love it, but actually, I am hate to say this, and she's not here so I can say it, but I'm actually twiddling my thumbs. That's what my phone calls are. A lot of you do the same. You made those phone calls. It's not the same as a text, is it? So what's a Facebook posting? What's that all about? Well, I could go on. I'm not finished, but my thesis in the book is that we create a texture. And the texture of relationships between each other is, has properties, like a weave. So when you send a text, when you send a text to, my wife, Abigail, has never written me a letter. And I resent this, because when I courted her, I did write her love letters, long love letters. And I write long letters to my daughter, Madeline, too, and she complains about that, the embarrassment of having a 12-page letter arriving in a Canadian camp in a canoe. Um, but um, she, my wife will send me very sweet texts. And it arrives, and it hits in here. That's an intimate bond. I get letters from some academic colleague friends, and it's nice. It's a different bond. It's a, it creates a different connection. The, the weave that ties us together is slightly different. And then the phone call is something else. And then this Facebook posting. This is, too, a kind of bonding between the people. I'm going to come, about, come to talk about who, does do the, who gets bonded through Facebooking. But the result is you kind of get a cloth with different weaves, different fabric tying you together. My argument, and this is how I think we need to think about it, is that communication was what makes people society, what makes society. You create society through the expressions and the techniques and the tools that you constitute this thing called texture. Now, <clears throat> once you take that on board, you start recognizing some things. And you can also recognize traps and errors and falls and, and failures in arguments, conceptual models and distractions. do a lot of work with my mobile division in Microsoft and prior to that, a lot of work with operators, mobile operators. And they're convinced that distance is the problem that their technology solves. And I say, it might have been long ago, but their technology creates something new, where sometimes space is distance is the problem to be solved, but sometimes in either distance, it's very weird sending a text to someone you're with. But 
actually, sometimes it's fantastically charming. Some of you might be texting each other now because it's like whispering. It's intimate. You're both together. The fact that you are together justifies it. But at the same time, when you're apart, it justifies the fact you should send a text. It's not because you want to be together. It's so that because you're apart, you can do things that you couldn't do together. Right? So the value of communication is precisely that it justifies being away. I can leave my wife and I can send her a love letter. She would be really freaked if I gave her a love letter across the kitchen table. She would say, what's going on? Are you having an affair? Right? So I have to leave her to say I love her. Some more muddles. It's about physical bodies, about communication and technology. It's about bringing bodies together. But if it's the case that the written word creates this magical, transforming experience which stretches the body, why is it then that so many of my colleagues spend so much time doing this? What is it they want you to do? To put everyone in bed together? How often do you want to be that close to each other physically? What does it mean to be that close to each other physically? I got really upset some colleagues two years ago who were devising a, a video conferencing system. Here's one. That it would succeed if the parties could see into each other's eyes that the glances were, whole, were held. And they explained this to me, and I started giggling. I said, so that moment when I gaze into someone's eyes, which is a very peculiar and emotionally suggestive thing, is the thing you want your video conferencing thing to do. So I'm like flirting with all these people I'm having a business meeting with. And worse, when I'm looking into them, this system would follow me, so I couldn't get out of their gaze. And this was the holy grail. They were bringing their bodies together. They think that communication technology is about bringing bodies together. So where has all the artfulness, where's the written word, where's the difference between forms of expression? Because it's perfectly true to say, sometimes you do want to be together. I do like to see my tiddler, Tatham, on a video phone call, Skype him. It makes me gush. I don't know why, but I do like to see him. And I send him emails, he has a little email account, but I don't, they're not really, they don't have content. It's just so he has some content, he has a message in his inbox at school, right? But, I, but So I, I do think bodies, bringing bodies together, is sometimes part of the texture you want to create. But it's weird to think that bodies is the, are the problem. It's a conceptual muddle. This is, this is a contemporary conceptual muddle. A vast sum of money has just been allocated in my corporation to solve the problem of communication. The problem solution is this. No. Social networks are social. Oh, ha, ha. oh, really? Are they really? Okay, so let's look at it. Um, one of the things you might say about people is that, um, and the texture that they create, is that there's a fundamental cleavage between two types of persons. Most of you are fortunate enough not to have to know me, so that when you see me down the street, you don't have to say hello. You can ignore me, walk by. Some of you, unfortunately for yourselves, know me. So if you see me and I see you seeing me, what do we have to do? We have to acknowledge that. We've got a social relationship. You can't say no to a hello. And if you do say no to a hello, you have to come up with a reason for it. For example, I'm an old dude, and I can say I was distracted. I'm worrying about paying the mortgage, or my wife's just left me. I have to come up with an account for not being able to say hello. Well, what's the property of social networks like Facebook well, Facebook, if you look at analysis of Facebook, Facebook's not about being yourself and then going over here into this public space and saying, hey, well, join me. If you look at what people do with Facebook, what people do with Facebook is say, here, gang, this is my mates, you're my mates here, let's go on Facebook together. I know I'm going to see you at school, I'm not going to see you at work, I'm not going to talk to you in the coffee room, but when we go home, let's prattle. In other words, my little social world is stretched and made even more of a social world and mediated in new ways. My little social world is extended, but not physically extended. There's no more bodies in it. But the great thing about Facebook, and this is very, very interesting, is that <clears throat> Facebook allows you to not say hello when someone else says hello to you that you're obliged to answer to. If you look at what teenagers do in America, and Dana Boyd's PhD, which has been published shortly, is a real upset for her because her argument is that social networks are about extending your social footprint. What she finds is that nearly all American teenagers use Facebook to socialize with people they already know by dint of being in the school, down the street, or relatives. But, and this is what upsets her, Facebook has a genius value. When you're in your bedroom, you get away from your parents. Madeline, my daughter, gets away from me, climbs, shows the door, and she's, and she's stuck a sign on the, on the front saying, drama queen inside, 
brackets, dad. In other words, don't come in, dad. Right? But being dad, knock on the door, come in, dad, what do you want? The trouble with bedroom.